Limitless Society for you. Limitless Society. You have Limitless Society. Oh, Limitless Society. And what's Limitless Society? Limitless Society. Um, you've launched Limitless Society. All I care about is one thing now, and it's Limitless Society. So what truly makes the Limitless Society different? And what is it about a coaching program that could differentiate from all the noise that's out there? I firmly believe in God, and I believe that God is our Father. And when I say our, I say every single person on this planet. What that means to me is that I and every single person is an heir to God. If we are his children, that would mean our potential is limitless. So when I tell people like, what do I teach or what makes me different? It's very simple. It's the one principle, the universal truth that I teach and then I try to press upon you, not how to get rich, not how to get ripped, not how to have better relationships, but how to do one thing and one thing correctly. And that is to become the greatest version of yourself. You can go to coachings, you can go to programs, you can go to mentors and they're gonna say, let me show you how to get this. Let me show you how to get this. Let me, let me show you how to have this. And I'm not gonna do any of that shit. I'm gonna say, let's look in here. But at the end of the day, when I stand before God, all I want to account for is, did you reach your personal potential? Did you reach your highest form of you? My man, welcome to the Roller Coaster Podcast. Thanks for having me, dude. Great to have you on. Excited. So, something I know about you, and something I think the world knows about you, is you're well accomplished. You've done a lot of things, a lot of things. <laughs> and, but I want to know from your perspective, what's the most meaningful thing that you've done in your life up to this point? You know what? I think the most meaningful. There's probably a few, but right off bat the one of the most meaningful things that i've done in my life was something i had a goal for forever ago and that was retiring my mom i actually six months ago right here on this couch um, i brought her in and just said hey i know you have you've had a rough life and dad died when we were young and and i promised my dad when he died that i'd take care of mom and uh I just told her, I said, listen, I'm not going to give you just a, an, a mountain of cash because that's not going to do any for you. Yeah. Here's a, a debit card. You no longer have to worry about money. You, you charge it however you want. I don't have a limit for you. There's nothing. Just here's your retirement card. And that was probably one of the most meaningful things that I've done in my life. I mean, there's others that I can think of, but that to me was something I always wanted to do. And I always planned to do. And then when I finally accomplished it six months ago, it was like, fuck, man, this is just, it's as good as I thought it would be. Damn, dude. That's heavy. Yeah. That's serious. Yeah. When did your dad pass away? When I was 21, 21 years old, I had just gotten back from an LDS mission. I was a missionary for two years. Um, my dad was actually sick most of my life. I was the oldest of five kids. And literally from the time I was eight years old to the time he died, it was always kind of told like, dad's not going to live forever. And you're going to probably have to be step up and be the patriarch of the family. Um, so on my mission, when I went for my mission, most people don't know about missionaries is you go for two years, you don't really speak to your family other than letters, right? I think it's a little bit different now, but you don't speak to your family. You get to talk to them twice a year on Mother's Day and Christmas. So I literally left on my mission. And when I left, I was thinking that was going to be the last time I saw my father because he was sick. He was not well. But throughout my entire mission, I always got letter after letter. I promise I'm going to be there. I promise I'm going to be there. I promise I'm going to be there. And nobody, not even my mom, believed that that would be the case just because he was so sick and there were so many issues. Well, when I got off my mission, I specifically remember like, how awesome it was my dad was there at the airport you know and the first thing he said he was like i told you i would be here i told you i would be here and within 90 days he passed away and it was it was crazy it was actually in my arms um he said he, he was like i'm not going to the hospital i'm staying here my mom called me at three in the morning i had moved out and, and it was in my own apartment my mom called me at three in the morning she's like hey you need to come home you need to give dad a blessing and you need to tell him it's time to be done. You fought the fight. You've done your thing. You stayed until he got home from his mission. So I did. I came over at three in the morning and then by 6 a.m. he had passed away. So that was uh, that was one of the reasons why um, 
that was such a big accomplishment for me because that time of my life at 21 was like my dad was so concerned about his wife and his children and I was the one that stepped up to have to fill that role and I essentially accomplished that you know six months ago when I said mom you're almost 60 and I know if dad was here he would have retired you because she still works I want to I want to be that for you. So yeah. here's a debit card and you don't have to worry about money anymore. So it was, you know, one of those just awesome, awesome experiences. I'd love to, you've got a painting of your dad actually in your office here. And so I've got, I think that's him. Yeah, yeah, right? that's exactly right. Um, what's the number one thing that he taught you that you've, that's stuck with you throughout your life? You know, um, so I have my event in September um, and I've been deciding on what I want to talk about in that event because I want it to be very, very impactful. And I keep going back to stories that my dad either taught me or didn't teach me that stuck with me to where I became what he wasn't. Um, and there's, there's two principles and this will, this will kind of be both. Yeah. So my father was, uh, he was an executioner. He would execute very well. And most people are, are good at executing, very good at executing. That's why we have so many nine to fivers. Nine to fivers execute, they get up, they go to work, they execute all day long, they come home, they make their salary and that's it. My dad was one of those people. He was a CEO of a company, he worked his whole life, he had a 401k, he did the whole thing, the safe route, the nine to five thing. And he was really good at executing. In fact, I think, I believe the reason he stayed around so long is because he had placed in his mind a date that he was going to execute living to. And then as soon as that date was done, he was done. But what I was born with and what I was raised with was I was a dreamer and I've always been a dreamer. And I realized really fast, there are still a lot of dreamers a lot. In fact, most people, almost all people daydream about 50% of their day. That's like a real statistic. So I realized, okay, I'm a dreamer. I'm definitely not an executor. Like, I'm definitely not that. But I realized that through watching my father execute that if I could couple daydreaming or dreaming with execution, I could absolutely accomplish anything I wanted to. So when mm. I was raised, I was literally this dreamer. I was always this crazy ass kid that had these stupid dreams. But I was never able to fully comprehend what I was capable of doing until I realized that you must execute. And I learned that from my father. Be an executioner like set out and then execute. And the problem is even people that listen to this podcast, they're going to question, they're going to say, Am, do I execute or do I dream? Most of them are not going to say, oh yeah, I'm a dreamer and I execute because that's not the case. And even for my, my event in September, like the people that are on stage, they're dreamers who execute. Everybody else that's in the crowd is going to ask the question, am I a dreamer or do I execute? Yeah. Yeah. And my message that I've learned is you must be both to accomplish anything that you want to accomplish. Yeah. Man, I love that point. How do you like, because I think it's true. I think people buy DNA naturally, they are one or the other. Mm -hmm. And so for those that are like you, that were dreamers that had to learn how to execute well, like what's your advice? How do you teach somebody how to become great at execution? I think, I think again, and we talked about this actually when you first got here, I think the the uh, the fast track or the shortcut or the cheat code is to have a mentor. And for me, I realized where I was inadequate, right? And then I learned my inadequacies from my father to become strengths. So my father really was my mentor in that inadequacy. I would I would pose the question for those who are saying, well, I'm a dreamer, but I don't know how to execute. Then you should find someone who is wonderful at execution and ask them to teach you how to execute. And then those who execute, those nine to fivers who are like, oh, I can execute anything. My discipline is unmatched. Everything I do, I execute. But I haven't spent a day in my life truly dreaming that you would then hire a mentor to teach you how to dream. Mm. Because the reality is, is every single one of us have the ability to do it. It's just whether we choose to chase it, to educate ourselves and to go after it and then to invest in the growth of it. And the thing is, is like most people would say, well, you can't you don't really need help 
dreaming, but that's not true. You do need help dreaming. If you can't see beyond your nose and you can't see something much more grander than what's in front of you, you need help dreaming. Yep. And if you're like me, who sees everything on a grand scale and you can't figure out how to put that into your mind to start executing, you should have someone help you figure out how to execute. So that that's what I would say for that. Amazing. So we're sitting in your home right now in, in Farmington, Utah. It's a beautiful home. It's up on the mountain. I can see it from the freeway, you know, <laughs> coming in. And, you know, you just took me on the tour. Obviously, to get something like this, you had to have dreamt this up. And then you had to have gone in and put in the work to be able to afford mm -hmm. to build something like this. So I want to kind of take maybe the audience through a scenario, like w talking about dreaming and then execution, like how did this place come Dude, to that's be? Such a great, that's such a great question because that literally is why I believe what I believe. So I lived down, um, down on the road where this, this first neighborhood was built. I lived in a house. It's a nice house. It's a $1.5 million house. It was a nice house. One night I was dating my wife and um, we jumped in a golf cart and I said, hey, I want to show you something. And we drove up here in the golf cart. Now, when we drove up here, it was nothing. It was a hillside. And we drove up. It was this windy dirt road. My golf cart could barely get up here. And we got all the way up here, actually right to where my front yard is, where my turf is. Because that's about all that was it. It was about a 10-foot perch. And I looked at her and I said, I'm going to build the house here and see this view, I'm going to have this view every single day. And of course, she didn't know then how crazy stupid I am. But she looked at me and was like, yeah, I don't, your $1.5 million house is great. What are you talking about? Like what? <laughs> and I had just moved into that house. I was only there for like six months when I came up and showed her that. And I just told her, I said, I, I know that this is where I want to be. This is what I want to do. I want to be on the hillside and I want to have the craziest view and I want to build everything in my home around the view because in my life, the greatest thing I can do is give perspective to myself and for those around me, right? And that's one of the reasons why we like naturally like views because they help us with our perspective. Every day, all day long, we walk around with a phone in front of our face, a screen in front of our face, and our perspective is right in front of our bumper face. Bumper to bumper, yeah. But if I can take you and I can put you up here and I can show you a 50 mile radius that you can see all the way to the end to, it changes your perspective. So I, I told her, I was like, this is what we're gonna do. Well, I didn't have the money. I've never had the money. People are always like, well, yeah, you had this. I've never had the money, ever. What I had was a desire to do something, and then I worked backwards. Everything I did, I worked backwards. So I owned the, the house down the street, and the neighbor across the street built his house. It blocked my view, and I was like, this isn't going to work. I'm going to buy this property. Well, this property was 10 acres, and I think it was set up for a few homes. And I was like, no, I want the whole thing. I never want any more neighbors. I don't want anybody to have the ability to block my view. So I bought the land. No idea how I was going to afford everything, but I bought the land. I, after I bought the land, I wasn't, there was no way I could build the house. So then I went in and I was like, well, how, what do we do? And it was like, well, you can get a construction loan. Well, dude, I'm self-employed. How do you get a construction loan? <laughs> so dude, I, I went to bank after bank after bank. Finally, I found a new bank with a new program that was like uh, uh, bank statement loans. Cause my taxes never showed anything because I don't pay taxes. Yeah. Right? Like not yeah. that I'm hiding. I just, I'm really good at not paying taxes. Yep. So I get a bank statement loan. Um, they give me a million dollars, a million dollars. Now, if you see my house, it's 10,000 square feet. It's on the side of the mountain. The lot alone was almost a million. They give me the, the million and I'm like, holy shit, dude, I can't build a $3 million house with a million dollars. There's no way it's not going to happen. But I never, ever once, once doubted that I would have exactly what I have today. I just knew I had to figure out some kind of way. What am I going to do? How am I going to do it? You know? So I was like, well, I'm going to get rid of my contractor. I'll use his license. So I'm going to pay him 10 grand for his license and he can be here randomly, but I'm going to run this thing. I'm going to hire and fire. I'm going to pay the, the subcontractors and I'm going to cut where I have to cut to make what I have to make. So instead of building out this huge, wonderful place that you see now, I did it in phases, like piece by piece. I was like, well, let's do the floor. Hey, I can't afford uh, hardwood floors because that's 70 grand and that's 70 grand over my budget. So we're going to do concrete. Uh, I can't afford this. So we're going to do this. I don't want to give in on this. So I need to figure out how to do this. And I essentially pieced everything together.
until ultimately I got to the place and I always made good money. Ultimately, I got to a place where I had spent about 1 million in my own cash and 1 million on my, my construction loan. So I was $2 million into it. And I, dude, I still remember we ended up getting married and right before, or right, right before we got married, we had our, our daughter who we have now. And I had built the rooms in the house for four kids, not five. So like halfway through almost being done, it was like, oh shit, she's pregnant. We have to have, so I had to redo it, which cost me a ton of money, which again, I went back to the whole, like, I got to figure out how we're going to make this work, you know? So that's what we did, dude. And I built it and everything I did, I bootstrapped it. I, I didn't have the money. I've never had the money. I've always figured out a way. And that's not to say I don't make money. Like people are like, well, you built a $3 million house. You don't have any money, right? Like I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah. But for people who come here and see a five, six, $7 million home and a yeah. helicopter and all that, they're like, oh, Keaton's got $50 million. No, 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 no. I will one day. Yeah. But I have learned how to create what I want with what I have. And that's how I've started all my businesses. That's how I've started everything is it's like, I know what I want and I know there's a way to get it plain and simple. Yep. It may not be conventional. It may not be traditional, but I'm going to figure out how to get it. And I did. And that's what I did here with the house. That's phenomenal. There's a lot of things we could talk about there. There's a lot of things we could unpack. I mean, I think the, um, I think one of the saddest things about the world that we live in today is people's lack of belief that they can have the thing that they want to have in life, right? And I think there's a lot of reasons that happens. I think some of it is the way that they were brought up, the way that their parents treated them, the social norms that they've been a part of, the media putting them in a box, whatever. The list goes on forever. What is your advice for somebody who says... I want to achieve a thing. I want to unlock a thing. I want to have the house. I want to have the car. I want to have whatever the thing is to just figure out how to go and do it and, and understand that even if you quote unquote, don't have the money, you can go and make shit happen. Um, you know, so what you said there, there, there was an underlining common denominator, and that was we were all born, and then we had limiting beliefs placed on us. You said media, family, friends, social media, whatever. Yeah. The truth is, is we're all born with zero limitations. Like, remember when you were a kid and you were like, I want to fly like Superman, or I want to become... I want to be an astronaut. I mean, you just, you got all these because yeah. you don't have any limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. And then as time goes on, you spend time with your family and your friends and people that you know, who then place their opinions and influence on you that dictate your belief system. And it's a limiting belief system. And then all of a sudden you wake up one day and you only believe in this because that's what you were raised or taught with. So the first thing that I tell people, you know, obviously for those listening who don't know who I am, I, I mentor people. Um, the first thing I tell people that I, when I mentor them is this, you are the sum total of your thoughts, what you think you are, plain and simple. If I want to become something different, I must first change my thoughts. So if that's the case, let us begin with all of the limiting beliefs that you've been given. They weren't had by you, they were given to you. Let's start there and then let's slowly dissect and get rid of them. And then when I get rid of those beliefs, let's build a new system. And the new system can be really simple. The new system is this. You have the ability to do and be whatever you choose, anything. You don't believe me? Cool. Let's go back to the 1800s when somebody at one point said, hey, I... I want to fly like the birds in the sky. And everybody around him said, there's no way you can't do that. You're a fucking idiot. That's not going to happen. And then today I have a helicopter that I fly around in with my family because at one point he believed that he could have something and then it was achieved. So no matter what it is, there's no such thing. There's no limits. You could say, well, what about this? I, I don't believe that's a limit. I just believe we haven't figured it out yet. Mm. And if that's the case, then when I teach people or when I talk with people and even those people listening to the podcast, it's like, well, how do I start? Well, you should start with your belief system. We should change the way you think because the way you think is who you are. And if we want to change who you are, we must change what you think. You do that one exercise, like li literally you do one exercise with me and we get rid of your limiting beliefs. Watch how much your life changes in every single aspect. And it's all because you were told by mom 
that you would never do this. And you were told by dad that this is impossible. And all your friends growing up told you, you'll never become that. And you took that in, you devoured it, and then you made it your own belief system. But it doesn't mean that it's true. So if we get rid of that, everything changes for you. Yeah, amazing. I want to talk about, uh, so this morning I was working out with a friend of mine named Manti Teo, who you might know. And Manti has a tribal tattoo mm -hmm. from his, you know, top of his shoulder, yeah. half sleeve, whole deal. And I noticed you have a tribal tattoo. I think you have one on your left leg and your right arm. All the way down my back, all the way down my chest. Talk to me about this. Yeah. Because you don't um, look Polynesian to no, me. No, no, no. And I'm not. Um, I... Uh, when I was 18, I graduated, I, I went down to Snow College and I, my parents just kind of dropped me off there. They were like, well, he's <laughs> not really smart, so we'll see how well he does. But I played football. <laughs> and I went down there and I, uh, I started rooming with, with a Polynesian kid who he was only 17. And most people don't know this about the Polynesian culture, but like once you get out of high school, your family just kind of drops you on your head and it's like, I hope you succeed, right? Yeah, yeah. There's not a lot of huge support, you know? Um, so his family lived in Alaska. They brought him down here, dropped him off. He was 17 years old. Huge, huge. 6'3", 380, huge. And we became really good friends. And I knew a little bit about the Polynesian culture, but I didn't know a ton. And then I realized as him and I started spending time together that everything that they taught, everything they did, how they ate, everything, how they believed, respect, loyalty, all of it, that I was like, this is, speaks to my core, you know? So I fell in love with the culture. And then I ended up, him and I actually ended up getting into a, uh, a really, really big legal issue. Um, long, long story short, a girl was, was raped in, um, down there and we found out that she was raped and we beat the shit out of the kid that did it. We went to his house, kicked his door in and beat the shit out of 300 and 380. Yeah, like like <laughs> it was bad. Well, we went to football practice later that day. We got arrested. We got sent to jail. Um, and in jail, they were like, how old are you? He's like 17. They're like, oh, you're going to juvie. Well, we need to talk to your parents. His parents were nowhere to be found. So my mom and dad were like, well, we, you know, because he had come around. He'd stayed at our house. He'd done all these things. We'll just, we'll become his parental guidance, you know, whatever. Yeah. So essentially, we dropped, we adopted him. Um, he became my brother in all, all sense of the word. Um, and, and then we ended up going to jail. I was in jail for a while. He was in jail for a while. It ended up getting worked out. Um, I came home and I was like, oh, I better get my shit together. So I'm going to go and be a missionary. I'm going to go be a more missionary. <laughs> so I actually ended up leaving on my mission. He didn't. He stayed behind and he said, hey, um, because he knew how sick my father was, he actually was like, I'm going to stay back and I'm going to take care of the family. So he did that. Like he checked in on my mom and dad every week. He called them. He visited them. He did everything um, and just became a part of my family. Like my family knew him as his name was Junior. We called him June. Um, he just became a part of the family. So when I came back from my mission, um, like he got married, I got married. And I actually I named my first daughter after him. His last name was Taya. So my, I named my daughter Taya. Um, and then when that happened, I don't know, two years later, we were talking. We we're like, let's go get tattoos. <laughs> like, let's go get tribal tattoos. Well, he was in Texas. I was in Utah. And I, I had always, like, I always have uh, Polynesians come to my house. They, they do what's called Faikava, where they drink kava. And it's a kind of a celebration ceremonial thing, but we used to do it once a month at my house. So I would bring all the Polynesians in from all of the areas to come hang out. We would do the thing. Anyways, when, when we did that, I met one of the, uh, the big tattoo artists here in Salt Lake from Frost City. His name was Lala. And I was like, hey, I want you to do my tattoos and I want you to do my brothers. We want to do matching tattoos. <laughs> so I started to have him do these tattoos all over my body. And then my brother ended up getting married to a very, very staunch Mormon girl. <laughs> and she was like, no, you're not getting tattoos. It's definitely not happening. So no. he actually never ended up getting any of the tattoos. But then at that point, I'm like a whole arm and shoulder in. I'm like, well, I guess I'm just going to finish out. and We're going to do my whole body in, in Polynesian tattoos. So not only do I subscribe to the culture and the people and the idea, but like that's really family to me, yeah. you know, and so... 
like people ask me all the time, oh, you're a white boy with Polynesian tattoos. And I'm like, well, it goes a little bit deeper than that. But, that's cool. But yeah, that's that's where those came from. Well, it's actually really interesting that you that you share that story. It's kind of shocking to me, honestly, because um, when I was in high school, we adopted a Polynesian boy as well. Oh, so I played cool. quarterback in high school and he played running back. And his uh, a little bit slightly different scenario, but similar to to your brother, which is, uh, his mom was really sick of cancer. His dad had left when he was a kid. Yeah. And she passed away about six months after they moved into our neighborhood. And um, I actually share on the podcast, and I've released a clip of this. I'll show it to you later. But I share an experience where um, he basically called me in the middle of the night and said, I, I love you, man, and this is going to be my last night. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commit suicide tonight. And I remember going out, and I found him randomly walking in the street and and – I said, come stay at my house. And he stayed there every night since, right? Yeah. So ended up graduating high school yeah. by the grace of God and serving a mission and doing all these sort of things. And so we probably have a lot of yeah. a lot of stories yeah. that we could but share with each other. But then you know, like the culture is such a beautiful culture. Um, For sure. It's all about family, respect, loyalty. Like, like it, it, it's so weird. I could call my brother at any time and say, Hey, I need you to come and do something. And he would be 100%. Here in a drop of a hat 100%. because that's how their culture is. And yeah. that's how I am. And yeah. that's one of the reasons why I connected so well is I was like, there's, there's times in your life when, when you need something. And I've realized that that culture teaches like those times are important. You got to be there. You got to do it. Yeah. You know, and so that's why I fall in love with. That's why I, you know, I have the tattoos that I yeah. have. To pivot a little bit here, people call you the muscle. Does anybody call you Keaton? Friends call me Keaton. like really close friends. Yeah. Oh no, just any friends. Okay. Like anybody who's a friend calls me Keaton, and then anybody who's a fan calls me the muscle. The muscle. Where does what, this come from? Um. So you know, we had a TV show called Diesel Brothers that just actually finished airing about a year ago maybe a little bit over a year ago, we did eight seasons. And in the show, <clears throat> there's four of us. Um, and we each had a nickname, whatever. Well, when we started the show, I actually didn't have a nickname. It was Diesel Dave, Heavy D, and then myself. And while we were shooting one of our videos, Diesel Dave just was like, I was doing donuts or something in a truck and he was filming it. And he's like, the muscles doing donuts. So he came up with the name and it just kind of stuck ever since then. So that was my... That was my nickname. So Diesel Brothers um, Discovery Channel uh -huh. ended up becoming like one of the maybe the top show on Discovery Channel for mm -hmm. several seasons in a row. And I mean, incredible what you guys did there. What did you do for that group? Like how much of that is Hollywood and how much of it is you actually working for the Diesel Brothers business and – doing you know, what you do. I, I get this question a lot because most people see what I've accomplished and they automatically think, well, it's because you were on TV. Um, the truth is uh, most of what you see on TV is fabricated, yeah. reality or not. Yeah. Um, the TV show was total bullshit. I yeah. mean, it's it, everything is fabricated. Everything's kind of fake. Um, I came into the company when it first started with Heavy D and Diesel Dave, when they first started giving trucks away. I came in and actually to help them blow up the social media and blow up the website, actually. Um, the website at the time was called dieselsellers.com, and I was selling advertising, and all. I was helping with builds. I was doing all kinds of stuff. I like to build businesses, so that's what we did. I helped them build the business. <laughs> Um, and then about two years in, I think two years in, maybe a year into filming, it was like, there's not really a purpose for me anymore, right? So it was time for me to be done with with the actual company doing anything that I was doing. Mm. Well, the Discovery Channel was like, no, 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 you can't leave. You're a character on the show. <laughs> we'll, we pay you separately, so you don't need to be here, but we need you for the TV show. So essentially, I was like, okay, cool. I, I'm okay with that, like, if that's what we want to do. So I actually, a year into filming, stopped completely working at the company uh, and building the company. Yeah. But they had given me the parts guy name. So that's what I was known for season after season after season <laughs> as the parts guy. But the truth was, I was never really 
an employee parts guy there. I was just a part of building everything in the yeah. beginning. Um, and I enjoyed it so much. I still did tons. Like anytime we did a build, I was usually a part of the build. So it wasn't hard. But again, I mean, the last six, seven seasons, I was the parts guy and all, all of that was fabricated bullshit. Yeah. Um, and, and, and even the same thing, like the TV show itself didn't pay a ton of money, but people obviously think something much different. So I tell people that story all the time. It's like, uh, what you see on TV is not necessarily the reality. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously this helped propel you in some ways to, to who you become today and helped with kind of your personal brand and these sort of things. But was it ever hard for you to be just like in the shadow of the Daves all the time? Man, I, that's a really good question. I think it was hard to see one, one thing I know about Hollywood or TV, whatever you want, is they kind of pick their favorites and then they favor them, right? And it was really hard for me to see like the Diesel Brothers was four of us. And then they slowly changed it into Diesel Dave, Heavy D. And then I slowly became the parts guy that was on the majority of the show. Like yeah. most of the show was actually Diesel Dave and I. It's not anybody else. Yeah. Um, and that got really tiresome where it was like, are, are we, is there four diesel brothers or is there two? And if there's only two, then why are you making me film so much? And why am I such a big part of the show? I always had a hard time with that piece. Yeah. I've never in my life had a hard time with anybody around me finding success. Like I've never looked at him and be like, Oh, fuck that guy. He got success, you know? Yeah. But I have always questioned, well, why, if I'm putting in the time and the energy and all the work, why am I not seeing what I should be seeing out mm -hmm. of this, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was always a little bit frustrating. Um, but, you know, outside of that, there wasn't – I've never really been in a shadow of somebody. And maybe that's just because I'm a big guy and I'm loud and I'm confident. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's never felt like, oh, well, I'm in the, you know, the shadow of of something. Yeah. But there was definitely often times when – when it was like, God, dude, I'm tired of the commercial that rolls up of Diesel Dave and Heavy D. And then you go to the show and it's like, oh, cool. It's 90% Keaton and Diesel Dave. And then there's a little bit of Heavy D and a little bit of Red Beard and a little bit of the mechanics. Yeah. That that actually got to me, yeah. that piece. Will this show ever come back or is it, no, is it hell done, no. done? Hell no. We told them last year we're done. They weren't really happy about it. Um, it was still a success. But what they do is they run you into the ground until they fizzle you out. Yeah. And we didn't want to do that. Plain yeah. and simple as that. It was just like. You left on a somewhat yeah, of a high. We, we left on somewhat of a high. It definitely wasn't the highest it should have been. But we learned as quickly as we could. Like these guys are going to run us into the ground and we're just going to be another bullshit show. Yeah. So we told them. We we're like, no, we're done. Yeah. In fact, I got uh, I had a, a, con a call three days ago with with them talking about wanting to do a new show with diesel dave and i it's like eh, i don't know we'll see um but the mm. diesel brothers 100 no yeah no i want to pivot and talk about the limitless society yeah. so this is a mentorship coaching program to my understanding that you're building i think particularly in utah but i i think even all over the world it's becoming more and more popular to have these coaching groups or these mentorship programs or these different things. So one thing I've heard you talk about, Keaton, is that yours is different, but they all say that, mm -hmm. right? So what truly makes Limitless different? And what is it about a coaching program that could differentiate from all the noise that's out there? Yeah. Um, I would be very specific in my answer. Uh, there are good coaching programs for everyone. Um, I think that there are good coaching programs specifically for different people that are different programs. So if I took 10 people, I wouldn't give all 10 people the exact same coach, the same program, the same mentor. I just wouldn't. It doesn't make any sense. So to say what's better for the masses, I don't necessarily know if that's truth, but there is better programs for individual people. Mm. And the reason why I would say mine is different is not that it would be for every single person, but that my demographic of who I speak to is much, much bigger. I see a lot of gurus, a lot of mentors, and a lot of coaches, they focus on becoming rich, which is great. I think that's awesome. If you're looking to become filthy rich, I'm not going to be the guy for you. I'm just not. Not because I can't make you rich or help you become rich or not because I'm not rich. 
but because that's not what we focus on. Yeah. I don't think that that's really that important. And when I look around at a lot of these, like, you know, you talk about all over the world, this is now starting to pop up. I'm seeing a lot of people pop up in one space. Uh, I'm going to make you filthy rich, or I'm going to make you a better man, or I'm going to make you whatever. So let me tell you what I would say is different about Limitless Society, and it's a really, really simple principle. I firmly believe in God, and I believe that God is our Father. And when I say our, I say every single person on this planet. What that means to me is that I and every single person is an heir to God. If we are his children and if we are an heir to him, that would mean our potential is limitless, which is why I call it limitless. Now, what would make it different for me than anyone else is not just that I would say, I believe you have the ability to do whatever you want but rather I'm going to teach you a universal principle and it's probably the most, the most important principle you could teach across the board. Not how to get rich, not how to get ripped, not how to have better relationships, but how to do one thing and one thing correctly. And that is to become the greatest version of yourself. Hmm. Now, now when I go back to an individual level, every single person is different. Every single person has different capabilities and potentials. But at the end of the day, every single person should work towards their greatest self, their greatest version. And your greatest version is different than mine mm. and mine different than his. But at the end of the day, when I die, when I stand before God, all I want to account for is, did you reach your personal potential? Did you reach your highest form of you? And if you can say yes and accomplish that, you're going to find peace and happiness and success and money and relationship, everything. Everything will follow. Everything. Yeah. And I don't know how rich you're going to be at your greatest version, but I damn well know it's going to be much more than where you're at right now. So when I tell people like, what do I teach or what makes me different? It's very simple. It's the one principle, the universal truth that I teach and then I try to press upon you, and then I push you to become the greatest version of yourself. I'm not going to push you to become filthy rich. I'm not going to push you to become insanely successful in one aspect. I'm going to say, let's turn everything from outwards to inwards and focus on you. And then when I focus on you and I make you the greatest version, everything else that you've ever wanted falls into place. We stop worrying about all that and we worry about this. And then everything falls into place. That's the difference. You can go to coachings, you can go to programs, you can go to mentors, and they're going to say, let me show you how to get this. Let me show you how to get this. Let me, let me show you how to have this. And I'm not going to do any of that shit. I'm going to say, let's look in here. And, and I don't know what you're capable of. I don't, because it's different for you than it is for me. But yeah. your greatest version is probably a billionaire. And my greatest version probably has $500 million. Yeah. And I'm not there and you're not there. Yeah. So then let's get there and let's do it in a group of people that are willing to do that. And that's, I think, what makes Limitless much different than every other noise that you're seeing out there. Amazing. Really well said. Now, do you feel like you have as kind of the leader of, not kind of, as the leader of this group, the head of this group, do you have the intuition to sort of see and help people understand when they have limiting beliefs and when they're not? maximizing their potential, right? Because a lot of people, they may go, dude, I hear you, but I don't know what I don't know about myself. It's hard. I don't, I have no idea how to get there. I don't know what my limiting beliefs are, right? So do you feel like you as a leader have good intuition to help people pull that out? Yeah, I think so. It's actually a really, like if they say that to me, I'm in a really great spot. Like if they say, I don't know what I don't know and I don't know my limiting beliefs, because that's never the conversation. It's yeah. always, well, I can't do that. Yeah. That's not for me. Yeah. That's never going to happen to me. My life would never do that. I'm not that lucky. That's what you hear. And what's hard is to break through that and say, actually, what you're saying is just a limiting belief. And let's just start there. And then the next step is to get them to the question that you asked, which is like, okay, I realize I don't know what I don't know. And I realize I have limiting beliefs, but I don't know how to change it. Mm. That's kind of the next step. Yeah. But the first is that. And, and dude, again, with my core beliefs of God and that he's our father, I have zero issue seeing in every single human being pure capability, like pure limitless ability. 
And, and in that belief, if I really believe that, which I do, I'll die over that belief, then I don't have any problem looking you in your eyes and saying, hey, man, you're probably fairly successful, but I think you have more. I think you have more. I would love to show you because there's very basic principles and habits, but I think you have more. And I know that if you put the time in, you will be very, very happy at the version of you that is next week, next year, Basically. 10 years. Love that. Do you introduce anything, you know, a lot of times you, people's brains in their normal state can't get to a place where they can address limiting beliefs in a big way. Do you practice things like breath work or plant medicine or other things to help people kind of open up their minds? Everything. I don't think that there's one correct way. I think, again, you go to the individual. You can't do things by the masses. Yeah. Most things are done by the masses, and the masses work for eh, 60 70%. So if you work on people in an individual basis, that would mean that every avenue is an actual avenue. You can't shut the door. So if I look at it and I say, hey, man, breath work really works for me. I love breath work, and ice baths really work for me, and saunas really work for me. You know what doesn't really work for me is plant medicine or any type of medication. It doesn't work for me, but I don't believe that it doesn't work for somebody else. Yeah. My mom's actually a therapist and she does um, ketamine therapy hmm. for addiction. And when she first got into it, you know, a lot of people were like, oh, this is kind of weird. You're giving them drugs to help them over drugs and blah, blah, blah. And I told her, I said, mom, if this is a route for somebody, I would chase it until the day you die. Because this may not be for me. It may not be for him. But there's probably 15 people this week that you're going to help that nothing else would have helped them. Yeah. So if you if you really believe that everybody has potential and capabilities, then you should be open to everything out there and at least trying it. Again, limiting beliefs is when you shut the door on a possibility. Yeah. I'm not the person that shuts the door on any possibilities in any aspect of my life at all. So if someone comes to me and says, hey man, I think that this is a route that helps people Okay, let's check it out, man. Yeah. I'm not going to shut the door on that. That sounds stupid. Why would I teach what I'm teaching and shut the door on something? I have one to share with you that I think is uh, is relevant. I, I've always been a black sheep, challenge the norm, don't do what everybody tells me to do kind of guy my entire life. But I and, and don't have many limiting beliefs, but one of them, and I told you a little bit about my story, but software guy, no presence online, nobody knows who I am. And that's pretty typical in, in my world. And I end up starting this podcast and I remember going and doing a breathwork journey. The first one I had ever done one-on-one -on -one guided with a facilitator. And I sit down with her and she says, um, she says, I want you to think about a limiting belief that we can address during the journey today. And I think about it. I think about it. She says, what is it? And I said, I don't believe that my message that I'm sharing with the world can reach millions of people. I've never done it. I've, the biggest stage I've ever been on was a thousand people. I've never like, yeah. I don't, I don't see a world where that's possible. So we go through the journey and during the journey and I'll share some things that happen. She said, if, if things get uneasy or you get scared or there's go to a safe place, yeah. right? And it was a mountain near my home in Arizona. And so at the beginning of the journey, I see myself from a kind of bird's eye view standing on top of this mountain and I'm all alone. There's nobody else there. And about halfway through the journey, I'm back and I see myself again. And there's a small gathering of people at the base of the mountain. And at the end of the journey, I find myself there one more time and I'm looking down and there's multitudes of people. Okay. And I come out of this journey and she says, Hey, tell me about your experience. And I said, it was life-changing. Here's why, here's what happened. And I share this with her and she says, see, you now know that it's possible. The next day, not even 24 hours later, I sit on a podcast with Jimmy Rex I share a story. A week later, a clip goes out. Today, it's been viewed by 12 million people. And the first day, it was viewed by over a million people. And it was like, all of a sudden, I just went, oh my gosh, like this breathwork thing, for some reason, I couldn't unlock that limiting belief. I went and did that. I realized it was possible. And right away, it was addressed. And now I believe that my message can reach millions of people. Dude, and that's what everything is about that I, I'm trying to share. Like. Yeah. At the end of the day, I don't care what it's going to take to get you there. But if I could get every single human being where you got after that breath work, yeah. can you imagine what this world would be filled with? 
and all it took for you was a breathwork session. Somebody else, it might be ayahuasca. Somebody else, it might be sessions with me as a mentor. Somebody else, it might be actually visualizing and seeing. Yeah. There's so many opportunities, yeah. and none of them are right or wrong on the mass, but some of them are for you and for me and for, you know, and that's essentially, dude, that's all I ever want to teach. 100%. You've got this event coming up. It looks crazy. I think it's going to be the biggest um, event like this in Utah history. I think so too. That's the plan. Talk to the audience about it. What do you um, got planned? So I, 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 in Limitless Society, I teach each week um, in the program. And uh, along with that, I've decided to do events. And in the events, I want to bring out the best speakers in my knowledge. So I decided I was going to fill up an entire arena of 10,000 people um, and call it the Limitless Arena event. Um, and I was going to have the baddest speakers in my world on the planet, like like what I think is the best speakers. So I decided to throw out there that I was going to have the best of the best. And we've got, I mean, the list is huge. I've got David Goggins, Gary V, Ed Milet, Andy Frizzella, Tim Grover, um, Eric Thomas, uh, Jen Gottlieb, uh, Pace Morby, Heavy D, Roman Atwood, Ryan Pineda, Brad Lee. I mean, dude, the, the list is unreal. That's like half of the speakers. <laughs> and so what I really want to do with this event is touch people and change people's lives. But I really wanted to, again, challenge my own belief system. Can I do this? I've been in the mentoring space for a year. Previous to this, I started 35 companies. That's what I did. I started and built companies. And I decided it was time to teach the world how to become successful. And I thought, you know what? This is another step in the direction of me understanding, like, very simply, do I believe I can do it? I don't know. I might as well lean into it and let's see if we can make it happen. And I firmly believe we're going to fill that stadium. I don't know how yet. And we got 60 days. Incredible. But it's going to happen. I love it. I love it, man. I hope I can be there. I uh, We're having a baby, obviously, like I've mentioned to you, but I will be there if I can, awesome. for sure. Um, you've, you've talked a lot about God publicly. Um, one, of the, one of the only guys in your space, to my knowledge, that speaks very openly about your relationship with God. Who is God or what is God to you? Uh, God is an actual being. He's a, he's a person, a personage. Is. We were created in his image, so I would imagine we are like him. We look like him. I imagine he looks like this. I don't profess to know what he looks like. <laughs> um, but ultimately, he's our father. And the reason why that connects so much to me is because I have children. And I've realized that the most I've ever learned in this life has actually been through being a father to my children. And so I don't know why people have painted him out to be so many different things. But for me, I fully understand what he is as I understand my relationship with my children. Yeah. I want the best for them. I want them to be happy. I'm okay when they get hurt as long as they learn. I'm never going to step in when I don't need to step in. And at the end of the day, there is nothing they will ever be able to do that will be without the bounds of my love and my support. It's not going to happen. And as often as they want to mess up and freak out and be pissed off, I will always be there. And as soon as they decide that they want to come back, whatever that is, I'm always going to be there. And understanding a father's role to his children has helped me understand who God is. Mm. And that's why I preach what I preach. Because at the end of it, if that's the case, and he really is a parent like I am, then all he really wants is for us to achieve one thing, which is our full potential, the greatest version of us. Yeah. Because he knows in that is happiness, success, peace, joy, all the things that all of us long for. Yep. We're going to wrap here on one more. Um, I could go on forever, but I know we've got other things, uh, other commitments. So I want to ask you this. You've, you've ended up surrounding yourself with some pretty incredible people in your life, right? Some of the people that you associate with or people that you mentioned are coming and speaking at your event. This may be a hard question to answer, but which of these individuals – has had the greatest impact on you and or you admire the most and maybe want to become like? Um, I would say two people, actually. Eric Thomas, uh, he put out a, a YouTube video, I don't know, in like 2008. It was called, "If it, as soon as you want to succeed as badly as you want to breathe, then you'll be successful. It's an unbelievable YouTube. It's only like 10 minutes, but it's unreal. 
and it changed my life. It changed the way that I looked at things. Um, an absolute awesome clip. If anybody's listening and has the opportunity, go watch that. So, so him, number one. And then number two is when I heard Ed Milet speak on stage for the first time and how his story was very similar to my story, and I heard how he put it out there and portrayed it, and then I looked at his life, right? Everybody keeps talking about, well, I should get a mentor or I should join a mentor program. You know what you should do is you should find somebody that you seek their life. Yeah. That's what you should do. Yeah. And then you should go to that person and you should say, I will offer you all the money I absolutely have to get where you're at. Show me how to get there. And I saw Ed's life even to this point, and he's much older than I am. Yeah. I said, I want that. I want the family. I want the money. I want the islands. I want the boats. I want the planes. I want the fame. I want the speaker. I want all of the things. I want the love. I want the temper. All the things I see in him, that's what I want. And, you know, recently I, had, I went to lunch with Tony Robbins. Same thing. I sat with him for three hours at his house for lunch. I was like, dude, this is awesome. <laughs> this is what I want. It's unreal. And so for me, it's, it's those people. Amazing. Brother, thank you for coming on. Absolutely, this was this man. was a pleasure. You dropped a ton of knowledge. And um, again, I know we're still a newer podcast. We're picking up a lot of steam, but I really appreciate you coming on Absolutely, at this stage. Man. Thank you for joining another episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast. It was a pleasure to have Keaton on today, the muscle, uh, and be in his home and grateful that he was willing to open up his home for us to come in and record today. The three things that I took away from today's episode were number one, the key to success, the path to success is two things. It's daydreaming and execution. Typically, people are wired with one of those things, but developing the other one and putting the two together is how you unlock success. Number two, wherever you want to go in life, it's important that you see somebody who's already gotten there and then reach out and hire them to be your mentor. Mentorship is, again, another key unlock to getting to where you want to go. And then number three, I love how he talked about his Limitless program and the greatest version of ourselves equals being limitless. That's a wrap for this episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast. Please like and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one.